All right. Welcome to week eight. Week eight is when we start talking about scripting. And when you talk about scripting on Unix-like operating system, it's referred to as shell scripting. It's comparable to batch files on DOS or PowerShell scripts under Windows. Um, except the language is significantly more powerful than what you find in a batch file. So it's comparable to what you'd find in PowerShell. I know you guys probably haven't learned anything about PowerShell, but PowerShell is Microsoft's most recent iteration of their command prompt, and PowerShell is really powerful, surprisingly. Um, but a lot of the PowerShell stuff was inspired by bash files. So here's a few details. I'm not going to go through all the commands in detail. I'm going to go over, I'm going to point out the gotchas. Because by now, you guys should know what loops are, you guys should know what variables are, and you guys should know what, you know, branching logic is. And if you don't know what branching logic is, it's also known as an if-then-else statement. That's pretty much all there is in a program language. That's pretty much all there is in a bash script. So a shell script is a text file that contains commands that can be executed by the shell. Just like when you learned writing a, b a batch file for DOS, you'd um, type in a bunch of commands, it would execute them. These are all commands you could run at the command line if you chose to, one by one. Normally what you do with these shell scripts is to automate complex jobs so you don't have to keep doing them over and over and over again. The bash and the bash shell has the capability of doing a lot of programming logic, like you'd expect. Um, and as I said earlier, it lets you ad automate your jobs. Uh, samples of automated jobs would be doing the nightly backups. Um, one, some of our jobs that we have that run on ba as bash scripts or at my day job is running um, the nightly build of jobs for our development of our, for our desktop products. Because we have continuous integration now, which means every time somebody checks in a change, it triggers a build. But what we normally do is at night we do a clean build once a night. So what this does, we have a script that what it does, it goes in, cleans out the entire build tree, checks out a fresh copy of the source code, grabs any dependencies, initiates a, a build. And then, you know, then it does the next one and the next one and the next one. Those are samples of jobs. Um, another one I've written in the past is one that archives artwork. Um, we manage some, some websites for some of our clients where they store templates. Um, you know when you buy a really expensive car, one of the options you can do is get paint protection films? So if anybody here has ever been to a BMW dealership, <laughs> students, and you decide you want to get your paint. It's called a paint protection film. So there's basically vinyl stickers, transparent vinyl stickers that are really, really resistant to impacts. And they actually put stickers on your car. Some of our clients actually design these templates. And we've written scripts that archive some of the stuff on a nightly basis. Not a, quite a backup, but as new versions are released, we take the old ones, we copy them elsewhere so that, you know, if ever something goes horribly wrong, they can ask us to give it, pull them back for them. Um, shell scripts execute commands sequentially. In other words, it's not like Java, where you have a class and then you have objects, and then you have an object that inherits an object, which inherits an object, which extends an object, which inherits an object, and on and on and on. It's like old school programming back in the day. The code comes in at the top, it exits at the bottom. So it's, this is known as top-down programming, literally. It goes from line one to the last line. You can define functions. You got to define them at the top so that they're already in memory. And then the exit. I'll cover that stuff later. But literally, the file's written read from top to bottom and executed in that order. You can choose to alter the order a little bit by using loops and functions. Um, but essentially, a shell script is a program. But it's a really clunky program. So a few characteristics. It's the scripting language. What is the difference between a scripted language and a compiled language? A compiled language 
basically gets compiled to either bytecode or to binary, and then the runtime executes that bytecode or the binary. A scripting language is read and run the entire, the whole file every time. It never gets compiled. So that means that between runs, if you modify the file, the program starts, stops working. Whereas with a compiled program, unless you do another compile, any changes you make, that won't make a difference. So they're, le they're less, they don't perform as well because the entire thing needs to be read, error checked, and all that jazz. It's high level. By high level, we're being a little disingenuous here. Um, it's saying like, it's high level the same way Java or PHP are high level. In other words, you're not typing assembly code. It, it abstracts some of the stuff happening behind the scenes behind some useful functions. Uh, I already said it was interpreted, uh, which means it's not compiled, it's read every single time and executed. Just like you guys are playing with an interpreted language now in one of your classes. Anybody want to point out which interpreted language you're having fun playing with right now? Anybody going once, twice? And now nobody paying attention to their web dev course? PHP, JavaScript, those are interpreted. You're all enjoying those classes, right? Well, that class. Those are interpreted language. It means they don't get compiled, they get read and run. And it is weakly typed, just like JavaScript and just like PHP. It is the opposite of Java in the sense of you cannot assign a string to a variable you declare as an integer, right? Bad things happen, it goes, you suck, essentially. With this, it doesn't care. A variable is just a bin in memory and you just put whatever the heck you want in that bin. So if you want to use your saucepan to make spaghetti one day, great. If you want to use your saucepan to you know, deep fry the same next day, you can do that too. It doesn't care because it's weakly typed. It doesn't actually have an assigned type to whatever you could put in the variables. They're just treated more or less as strings. And in contrast to Java, Java is object oriented. Hopefully you know that by now. You're almost done your second term. Uh, it's also high, led, high level, it's hybrid compiled. In other words, it kind of compiles, but it compiles to bytecode, then the bytecode is executed, as opposed to say C++, which executes straight to compiles straight to a binary. And Java's t strongly typed. Okay, so here's a few examples of some very simple scripts. There is a Let's say I had a script called who's on. And what it outputs is the current date and time. And it lists out the user that are currently logged in. And it runs the who am I command. So it's the same as if you typed in all those commands one after another, but it just runs them for you. And the other command they have there as an example is list the root directory. So it goes to root, runs ls, and outputs the present working directory. Those are commands you've all seen so far. There's no magic logic happening here. However, when you want to execute shell scripts, there is a few things you need to put in place first. Um, the first thing is you should make it executable. So as you can see, there's a chmod command for that. And it's making it, in this case, chmod u plus x, whatever the script file is called, makes it get executable just for the user and not anybody else. Not that that makes a difference. I'm just saying, this just saves you a couple of keystrokes because you can run a command without it being executable. I just, you could type in the word bash space the script name, it'll still do the same job. Um, you could put the script anywhere you want. If it's in the current directory, you'd go dot slash whatever it's called and that'll work. Um, or you could create your own directory and you'd add it to your path. So if you have a bunch of commands that you run on a regular basis and you don't want them spread all over the place, because as programmers you should learn to be tidy and keeping your shit all in one place, as hard as that is, um, what you can do is you create a directory, for example, my scripts, and then you'd edit through your path. You guys should know about the path since you guys have had to play with your various path settings under Windows to get your Java environment to work. 
Um, and you could actually add that line to your bash RC file, which is a hidden file in your home folder. Actually, that one I'll show you what it is. So, so this is my bash RC file for root. And Gonna make it a little bit bigger. You can see a bunch of stuff in here. And the bash RC file is literally a bash script. So it's a script that gets executed every time you log in. So in here you could add stuff to modify your path permanently. And as you can see, there's all kinds of fun stuff in here. But it, like I said, this one here you can modify and add various things. So if you wanted, if you had your script in a path that could be executed, you could just type in the name of the command, it'll just run. You don't need to tell it to run. Now, if you don't have execute permissions, as I was just saying a few moments ago, you could always just type in the command bash, space, whatever the file is called, then you can run any file to your heart's content. So giving it the execution permission, all that does is it makes it executable without you having to run a command in front of it. It saves you five keystrokes. Or even better, it saves you two keystrokes. Because you can also dot space whatever the script, and it'll run the script also. There's just two different ways of doing it. If you run bash space script file, it launches a fresh copy of a shell. So it makes a second copy of your current running environment runs the script in there, then discards it. If you do it, a use the dot or the source command, it runs it in the current environment. And if you change any environment variables, such as the path and stuff, it'll put it in there also. Now, the very first line of any bash script should be specifying what the command interpreter is. There's a few reasons for this. Although most bash scripts are written in bash, obviously, because otherwise they wouldn't be bash scripts, you could actually create a command file, a text file that's actually running on Python. So if you wanted to run it and execute it without specifying what it is, you could actually put in the very first line and make it bin Python instead, and then this would be a Python file, and you could write your shell script in Python instead or in PHP, or in Perl, or in TCL, or in insert other language here. Whatever you've got that's interpreted can go there. So the very first line should be pound, exclamation mark, slash bin, slash bash. That will make it a bash file. Now. As you can see right there, it talks about how you can define a different shell. In this case, it's defining a TC shell. And if it's, that's the first line, that means it'll be executed by, TCS, by TSCH or TCSH. One of those two is wrong. And it'll run with that shell instead. So that means you might get other shells have different utilities, like C shell has C-like syntax. Some people actually are more comfortable working with C shell than they are with bash because it looks a lot like Java, including the if statements. Comments. You guys by now should all know how important comments are. If not, you've all learned how important useless comments are because, you know, some of your profs insist you comment every other line of code you've ever written, whether regardless of what it's actually doing. However, comments are important because it helps you understand what's going on, especially with things like bash scripts. Um, <coughs> if you can see here, these guys, your bash RC has a bunch of comments in it. And the comments is not with a slash star, it's not a slash slash, it's pound. The hash symbol for those that don't know what pound is. 
No, it's not hashtag. Whoever calls that a hashtag in my class, it will be laughed at by me. It is a hash symbol, which is why I try not to use that and I call it the pound symbol. Because that's what it used to be called originally. Comments are good. They tell you what's going on. Any line that starts with a pound symbol is a comment. If a pound symbol is the first character or the first line, it's not followed by an exclamation mark, it assumes it's a comment. If it's pound followed by an exclamation mark immediately, such as this, then it's a shell, it's an execution shell. But that only works on the first line, first character of the file. This is where you're going to learn that Shell scripts are really space sensitive. It cares a lot about spaces. I mean, a lot. You've gotten probably in Java and PHP and JavaScript, you've all gotten kind of lazy because they really don't care about space. You could have your file properly indented. You could have it look like a dog threw up on your keyboard. It's still going to work as long as the code is valid. This cares. Um, most of the time when somebody comes to me and goes, my script does not work, I spend half an hour trying to find a stray space. No, really, I've spent over half an hour trying to help a student, it was just a space. So, just watch your spaces. Um, the variables do exist in this, and they hold strings and numbers. You can compare them, you can pass them in and out of functions. Um, you don't need to declare them, so unlike Java where you go string name equals new string. I'm assuming that's valid Java. I don't know. That'd be valid C sharp, but you know, we'll go with assuming it's valid Java. This one here, you can just go name is equal to Dan. It doesn't care. And the syntax is straightforward. Variable name is equal to whatever the heck the value is. Just like in PHP, just like in JavaScript. There it is. However, Remember I was talking about spaces? They cannot, if you're assigning a value, there cannot be spaces on either side of the equal sign. Because then it becomes a comparison operator. Yes, sir. And we tried to stop, we don't use the equal sign as a comparison operator whenever possible. There's other ones that are better behaved. Because so many people make the mistake of sticking spaces around it and suddenly it becomes comparison operator or it becomes something else randomly. If you're going to assign a variable, there's no spaces. Variable name, equal, value, no spaces in there. If it's a string, you quote it, but you know. So the weird thing is when you declare a variable, there's no dollar sign. When you use the variable, there's a dollar sign. Why? I don't know. Somebody in the dark ages of BSH and then Bash decided this made sense. No, it doesn't. It's just, this is one of those languages where you just accept how weird it is and you just go with it. So when you declare a variable, it'd be like my var is equal to something. My var does not have a dollar sign. However, now, Anytime you want to actually access the value in my var, you have to put a dollar sign in front of it. At least you'll feel somewhat more comfortable because of PHP, you're starting to see use case seeing dollar signs, which you can guess where PHP got its idea for dollar signs. Except they decided to be standard all the way across and they put dollar signs everywhere. And the basically dollar sign my var is how you access the value of a variable. It kind of sucks, but that's how it's done. All right, math. Math is special. Math is special in any language. Math is extra special in this language. So there's two ways of doing arithmetic expressions. Notice there's two parentheses at each end. The two parentheses tells it, we're about to do some math, folks. You have to actually warn it. It's about to do some math. 
It's a bit like, you know, when, you're you, when you were in grade school and the teacher comes in and goes, students, today we're going to learn about arithmetic. And they had to warn you that's what was happening so your brains could change gear. Bash scripts are the same way. You actually have to warn it what's about to happen. So if you want to do math, you got to put it in a pair of parentheses. And there's two forms. A variable name is equal to math operation, or you can just do the math operation and pass the value out. And there's a few arithmetic operations. You guys are used to seeing plus plus. You're going to increment the value of a variable. Congratulations. Um, I'm assuming Java has minus minus decrement. PHP kind of has it, but doesn't. It doesn't behave quite right. <laughs> um, if you want to use an exponent, it's two asterisks because you know you're going to multiply it twice. I don't know why. That's just what they chose it was going to be. Other languages, it uses the caret, right? Little hat. It's like the first time in years I've remembered what it was called on the fly, the little hat. These guys use two asterisks to have to do an ex exponent. Multiply, congratulations, is the same as you're used to seeing. Division, which is really misspelled. I've never actually noticed that was misspelled before. Is the same as you guys are used to seeing. Uh, your modulus is the same as it is in PHP. I don't know if that's what it is in Java, but it's the same as PHP. Uh, also known as the remainder operator percent sign. Add in subtraction is the same. So other than exponents being different, it's the same math operators you're used to seeing. Except, please notice what you don't see anywhere in any of these. There's no spaces. You cannot have white space in a math operator, otherwise it doesn't know what you're doing. It'll actually cave. So I'm actually going to do this first line just to show you guys. Uh, wow, that's uh, not handy. Make that a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger. Clear my screen. It's cool because I don't need to put these in a file to execute them. I can just You know what we should do is hide his laptop. Just put it on the desk on the other side. When he comes back, he won't even know what happened. Um, count is equal to 10 plus 20. So that's what's cool about this is basically if you want to test a line of code and you don't want to put it in a script, you can actually run it at the command line. It'll work. So if I hit enter here, I get no error message. But now I could go, and my count is 30. Yay! I could also go and that's not allowed because I suck. Because I need to tell it it's a variable. Bash is weird. Just warning you now. Yeah, when you're doing your labs, you're going to be referring to these slides an awful lot. Um, and as always, it also follows the typical rules of math where it does, you know, the, the Bedmas rules, brackets, exponents, multiply, divide, addition, and subtraction in that order. Yes, I actually had to go through the, the acronym in my head to get it out. So as you can see, there's a few ways you can handle this. Now, for example, uh, another thing I can do is if I go, I could also just go count plus plus, and if I echo count again, now it's gone up by one. Do you notice I'm doing math on count, but I'm not referring to it by its dollar sign? Why? I don't know. It is what it is. Um, I have read in the past why it's like this, and none of the arguments were valid. Just saying. It, it is what it is. You just accept it. Um, please note, bash scripts can only do integers. 
We were all supposed to make like. It's okay. Next time, mute your laptop. If you need to do floating point math, you have to use an external utility. Something like BC. Yes, there's a command for, for math. And. And that's a file. If I remember how to use BC, I don't remember how to use BC off the top of my head. Really? I'm so used to working in Windows. So you can launch BC in interactive mode, and then you can make it do math. Four divided by three is one. Yay. Three divided by four is zero. But you actually have to tell it what precision you want to put it in. And I don't remember how to do that because I never use it. My bash scripts don't involve math usually. <laughs> um, now, there is an exit status when you run a script. And essentially, if it's a zero, it worked. If it's anything but a zero, it didn't work. It may throw a bunch of anything, but if it's a zero, it's all good. And as you can see, with this interesting syntax, the exit status is kept in a shell variable. So the script runs. It sets this exit value to something in memory. It doesn't tell you what it is. And then you can just echo dollar sign question mark. Dollar sign question mark gives you the last exit status. So if you want to know if a command ran correctly, you tell it to output dollar sign question mark. And it can be any value between 0 and 255. So you can choose to uh, let it exit or end the program, and if it runs successfully, it'll give you a zero. Or you can choose to um, force the status code. So let's say you wrote a script, and depending on what happens, you want it to give you a different exit code. One, the files were copied successfully. No, sorry. One, it failed. Two, the files were copied but not deleted. Three, you know, you can set a bunch of exit statuses that way. You can actually capture that and tell you tell yourself. So if you type in the command, there's literally to end a script. The command is called exit. Uh, did you guys learn about exit for PHP yet? Or how about die? It's the same idea as die. PHP has a command called die. When your script, you want your script to finish and fail badly, it's called die. But die lets you output a message as part of the death. Um, so this allows you to give an, an exit status code and you give it a number. So the command would be exit 1, exit 2, exit 240, but not more than 255. So as I just explained already this. Now, there is a helper program called the test helper. Remember earlier I was talking about how the equal sign is the equality operator, but not quite? Instead, they created a helper program. And the helper program has a series of arguments you can feed it. So if you guys are used to doing the good old greater than and equal, or the equal equal, or the not equal, or the or, or whatever, um, instead you're going to use dash LT, dash LE, less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, equal to, not equal to. Those are the ones they give you. So you can also use the equal sign, because I said you could. And what's the difference between when it's an assignment operator and not an assignment operator? There's a space around the equal sign. So if you go variable is equal to 3 and there's no spaces, it's assigning 3 to the variable. If you go variable space equals space 3, it's checking to see if the variable is equal to 3. 
Like I said, I spent half an hour once helping a student trying to find a stray space. It's because of stupid shit like this. That's why I tend to tell people don't use the equal, the equal and the not equal sign as your, uh, your check operators because it's actually harder to actually start troubleshooting. You're better off using the dash EQ and the dash NE instead for equal or not equal. At least visually, you know right away what it is you're trying to do. And at that point, you know, spacing is still an issue, but at least it's more obvious. Um, there's also dash N, which tells you if the string is at least one character long. Dash Z checks to see if the string is zero characters long. Because, you know, it might be a null instead. Um, there's a few other handy helpers it has in there. You can check to see if a file exists, dash s. Um, actually, dash e checks to see if the file exists, so that one makes sense, right? Dash e exists. Dash s is to not, if the file's not empty, so size, I guess. F is a normal file, not a directory. Dash d is for a directory. Dash w, dash r, dash x. So you can check for permissions. The last three let you check the permissions on the files, so that maybe you want to make sure the file is writable before you try to modify a file. So you can go if dash w space file, which returns true or false, you could actually choose to output, or otherwise you could exit an exit code saying, hey, I can't change this file. All right, so this is the stuff you use inside of an if statement. Just saying. Um, I'm, I do cover ifs at some point. I don't know if it's today or next week. I don't remember how far into the slides it is. Um, but that's what you use inside the if statement. It, this is actually faster. The, this batch commands here is a lot faster than writing the equivalent in Python or in Perl. This is really painful to write in Python and Perl. Because you actually have to do specific commands that require a lot more code in the front to check to see if the files are there. The echo command. You guys should know about echo thanks to PHP. And it's the same deal in a bash script. Echo outputs, com outputs content to the shell. Um, however, echo also behaves like HTML. As you've experienced, in HTML, one space is one space. Five spaces is one space. A tab is also no space. Shell scripting behaves the same way. It ignores more than one space. If you want more than one space, you've got to put quote marks, which is fine. So just to show you guys again, a little bit easier, I go, this is really spaced out. And I'll just do it all as one set string of no extra spaces. On the other hand, if I did this again, but then I threw quote marks around it, then it treats the spaces as spaces, not as separators. So basically what it does, it treats the space as a separator unless you put it in quote marks. Then it becomes. And even better, I can even include my number from earlier in there. Just like how you do in PHP when you want to do what's called variable expansion, which I don't know if that's how it's been taught to you, but that's what that, that's actually called. If you include a variable inside of a double quote in PHP, it's known as variable uh, expansion. That's what that's doing, is it finds a variable, adds it to the string, and outputs it. It's like doing uh, insta concatenation. So that's the echo statement. And I already covered this slide <laughs> as I was discussing it. Um, echo also allows you to do a few other items. Um, if you don't want it to output a carriage return, you can say dash n. So that means if you're actually going to prompt someone for their for like a value of some sort, like person's name or user's name or user's home directory or something, if you do the dash n, it'll actually keep it all on one line. So the, the cursor stays at the end. 
Um, and you can actually tell it to uh, interpret the backspace, backslashes using E as an escape. There's actually some logic behind some of these arguments. It's just, you know, a little gross. And you can tell it to respect the backspace to get rid of the trailing new line or to add a new line. So if I were to do echo dash E, it'll respect the backslash n. If I don't have the dash e, it'll literally output the backslash n. So unlike Java and PHP where it always respects the escape, this does the other way around. You have to tell it to respect the escape. It's just a quirk. Uh, if you want to get input back from the command prompt or your script. The command's called read. Not sure what it is in Java, but you know, I think it's something like read line or something. Or it used to be something like the read line way back in the day. So if I were to go and I don't want to include the new line. Now it's going to prompt me for my name. Nothing else has happened, but now if I go I have a variable now. Until I log out, I have a variable called my name and it's set to Dan G as long as my machine is running and I haven't logged out. And the read command has a few arguments. You can either do the echo and read, or you can actually do a dash p. It'll do the exact same thing. Uh, you can define a prompt as part of the read command. As typical in Linux, there's more than one way to do the same thing. Neither of them are great. They just do different jobs. Dash s is silent mode. Let's just say you're prompting someone for a new password. And you don't want the characters to be displayed on the screen because that's stupid. You do dash s. So you know when you guys sit there and you type, when you go su right now on your VM and you hit enter and you start typing your password and your cursor never actually really moves? It just stays there? Basically what's happening is the password is being prompted in silent mode. In other words, that's how Unix makes things safe by making it so that you can't even tell how many characters were typed. Makes sense. And then t is for a timeout. In other words, after so many seconds, stop waiting, just keep going. So you can time out the request. So if I went this and I go read dash timeout of three seconds, if I remember right, that's how that works. One, two, three, and then it bombs out. So after three seconds, if you didn't give it input, it's over, which is cute. cute. So for example, let's say you're writing a script and it prompts you for a username and then the next prompt would prompt you for their home path and you choose not to include a home path, you could put a timeout of five seconds and if you haven't started typing in those five seconds, it's not going to, it's going to create a default home path instead. Oh yes, the if statements are today, good. Um, so, decision making uses if, yay. It's if condition then, almost like it is in basic. And, I, and I'm pretty sure there's nobody in this room who's ever actually programmed in basic except for maybe one person. And even then I might be assuming his age. Basic was the language that everybody learned in the 80s and early 90s. That was our first language. Uh, a lot of software was written in basic. It uses a very similar syntax. So if condition, then, whatever. Except, how do you end your if statement? 
fi, because it's the opposite of if. You open up with if and you end with fi. We don't have curlies. Yes, sir. Um, we also have an else statement. So if condition, then, whatever, else, something else, fi. This is just like you guys are used to doing with Java, except you don't have brackets and you don't have curlies. Got none of that. However, you can actually put square brackets to combine things. <coughs> um, you can do multiple operators and or not. And this one should look familiar. Double ampersand for and, double pipe for or, pound, I mean exclamation mark for not. And I'm not even going to explain the difference between and, or, or not because if you don't know what that is by now, you're definitely in the wrong field. And we also have an else if. It's known as elif, E-L-I-F. So you can go if, then, elif, then, else, phi. And there's a whole, this is probably your best chart to explain to you how the if statements work. So there's a whole chart that shows the whole if, else, if, else thing. Um, if I go back to this bash RC file I had going earlier, right here. It's going if that file is, if that variable is empty and, you know, whatever dash, uh, dash r is readable, then it's going to do this. Now, as you can see, I've got each conditional in a series of square brackets. And as you'll also see, there's white space around them. So let me just highlight properly. Oops, nope. There we go. There. There's a white space on the inside of each of the square brackets. Guess what happens if that white space isn't there? It bombs out with an error. And that's where I spent that half hour trying to find that person's space as I didn't, I was missing a space, visually missing a space. Um, and as you can see, there's the then at the end. And then I'm sending a variable. We also have case statements, just so you know. And the syntax is really extra stupid. Oh, here we go. Here's a nested if for everybody's enjoyment. So if you're actually curious about what the syntax should look like, when you log into your VM, edit the .bashrc file. There's almost one example of everything you'll ever need in that file. It's like having a portable um, quick lookup. I'm trying to figure out how to do this and just scroll till you find what you want. Then you copy it and you paste it somewhere else. And uh, see this one here is checking to see if something's equal to yes and they're using the equal sign, not the dash EQ. But it'd do the same job. Again, you can see space, 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 space. And the best part is the yes is not quoted, but that works anyways because it thinks it's a string. Um, so, dollar sign brackets encloses the command that's run in the subshell. So, you can theoretically launch another shell and run it temporarily. So, it's as if you were spinning off a variable in memory. Actually, that's not even the right example. Imagine you try to run a, you're in Windows and you go to run a command and it launches a sandbox and runs a command inside that sandbox. That's what a subshell is. Um, I don't think there's any Mac users left in this room. Surprise. Um, Mac users have experienced the joy of the, the sandbox where software runs in a sandbox and stuff that happens in the sandbox stays in the sandbox. And you can't uh, work with stuff outside the sandbox. It's a known issue on Macs and it's coming to Windows. Um, 
so what happens to the subshell is whatever happens inside that subshell stays inside that subshell. So variables that are defined in the subshell stay there. Commands that are run in there, the output gets passed out, but anything else that's done stays in there. All right, here's a slightly better script. So what's happening here is it's setting your directory one equal to your current working directory. So it's executing PWD, taking the output, passing it to that variable. Then I'm checking to see if the directory belongs to user one, as in I'm in user one's directory. And it'll say, hey, by the way, this is where you are. Otherwise, it tells you where you are. Not a useful command, but you know, it at least double checks to see if you're actually home. This one shows how to get some user input, includes an if statement. So do you want to continue? Read yes, no, assigns it to a variable called yes, no. And if yes, no is equal to y or uppercase y, do you notice what we can't do? We have to check for all the permutations. And this, this one's kind of stupid because what happens if the person typed in y yes? It would just bomb out and assume you said no. So realistically, this should be going for if yes, no is equal to Y, if yes, no is equal to capital Y, if yes, no is equal to, you know, yes, capital yes, varying versions of spelling yes in capital letters. Um, that's why you're better off adding at the prompt here that you should add a YN. And this does the if, then, else, and ends the if statement. And this is just more versions of the same thing. And it's using if then a series of elifs and echoes out to the end. Now, this is gross. And I guess by now you guys have learned about the, the uh, switch statement in Java, right? I hope. You know, the switch statement, the better if statement. The if statement has a default water down waterfall effect. We have it in this. It's called case as opposed to switch, but basically the switch statement in Java is a case statement. It's just that's what it's called. And it's a little weird. So you go case, give it a word. This could be a variable, in, and then you give it a series of patterns. And the patterns are delimited by a single bracket, not opening, closing parentheses, clo just a closing parentheses and then the commands that apply to it. And you can actually use pattern matching in here. We can use a star to match all patterns. You can match single characters. Here's an example. Prompt for do you want to see all files? Yes, no. Case, yes, no, in. And we have lowercase y, uppercase y. That's going to happen. Lowercase n, uppercase n. It's doing that instead. And then at the end, we have the dollar sign. The dollar sign at the end is the equivalent of the default statement in your switch statement. So if everything above it fails, it'll cascade down. Now, here's the other cute little thing that you may have noticed. Sucks for the ones that aren't here because that doesn't get recorded when I walk over to the screen. See this right here? That's the equivalent of your break statement. So in theory, you could go, yes, no, you miss this, it'll then do the no. So it'll still waterfall just like a normal case statement into the next one down unless it sees its equivalent of a break statement. You had a question? No, sorry, it's the asterisk sign, dollar sign. Use the wrong word, the asterisk. Asterisk is your default, not dollar sign, sorry. So that's how you do a case statement. And of course, following the amazing logic, how do you end a case statement? By writing the word case backwards. How do you get out of a case to ESAC? Frig if I know. Um, here's a different case statement. <coughs> so, this 
decides how much you're going to pay for something based on your age. And you know what? I'm just gonna, I wonder if, oh, good. Instead of walking over there, I'm just going to use my laser pointer. So right now what's happening is we define five pri uh, three prices, right? A kid is five, an adult is 10, a senior is six. So we define a, a child for being zero to 12, an adult price is 13 to 59, a senior's 60 to 99, assuming they can't live past the age of 100. If they're more than 99 years old, it's invalid input. I guess either they get in for free or they don't get to come in at all. I don't know. So we prompt for the age, then we're gonna do a case statement on the age. And uh, right here you'll see zero to nine, pipe, one, zero to two. So this is gonna say anything from zero to nine or 10, 11, or 12. It's a really weird syntax. But that's how you do a case statement for checking a range. So same thing here for 13 and up would be one, so it always must start with a one. It'll be from three to nine. And then this will go from two to 59. So this will go from anywhere from 20 to 59 based on the position of the characters that you typed in. And then this is checking 60 to 99 down here. And then you've got the catch-all with the asterisk at the end saying, hey, by the way, anything else failed. This outputs the price, of the, the child's price of this, the adult price of that, and senior price of that. And here's our break statement here. So what we did in this one is instead of having a nicely formatted case statement that's on multiple lines like this, it just goes to show you can actually have the, in, the entire statement on one line. It's a little gross. It's harder to read, but it just shows it doesn't care about that. Some of you may have seen something that looks similar to this in your database lab with that damn MySQL script that doesn't work right. For uh, that, uh, that one task where you're supposed to bring in this, that gives you a script, it creates the tables and every time you try to insert data, it blows up. It's because there is a, um, a uh, check constraint that was created using this syntax. That doesn't work in MySQL, by the way. I've had to help a few students with that problem too. They're not even in my class and I'm helping them. Um, but yes, this is actually using pattern matching. So this is actually regex, just so you know. It's saying character one is this, character two is a range of values between three and nine. And then there's parameters. So believe it or not, this slide, this set of slides from today will get you through everything you need for lab eight. and most of what you need for lab nine. So you'll have almost everything you need to finish the labs going forward after this. Um, so you can choose to pass parameters into your scripts because that's handy. Because sometimes you want to run a command and you want to actually give it arguments. Uh, maybe you want to write a command that creates a user, a new user. When you create the new user, instead of prompting for the users, you can just say, you know, first arguments, the username, second arguments, the path, third arguments, the shell kind of thing. And it will allow you to have up to nine, arg well, 10 arguments, zero through nine. However, argument zero is not one you can set. Argument zero is the name of the script. So you can actually get the script to make sure, you can ask the script, am I running myself? So if you got some logic somewhere or you got a script that calls another script, which you can do, you can actually check to see where you are by base looking at argument zero. And then one through nine represents uh, the stuff you're passing in. So the arguments work as follows. If you go pass in arguments one and argument two, so if you had a command called display it and you pass in A and B, display it becomes argument zero a is one, B is two, dollar sign two. So the arguments are positional. However, for some unknown reason, somebody decided they might need more than nine arguments to, well, yeah, nine arguments to a script file. So you can give it more. 
by using a shift command. So if you had more than nine arguments, you can tell it's shift by five. So suddenly, dollar sign five becomes dollar sign one. Anything past nine now becomes six, seven, eight, nine. So you can keep shifting through the arguments. And here's the example. So we have a command called shiftem, and we feed it 1 through 10. You'll see that if I were to echo 1 to 9, it'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If I shift it by 1, it'll then go 2 to 10. So that's what shift does. It actually just slides a window down the arguments. You can, you can, at least you used to be able to, feed it a negative value. So let's say you shift it all the way this way, now you want to go back the other way. You can start feeding negative shift values and start sliding it back down the list of arguments. You never have more than dollar sign $1 to dollar sign $9, but you have a window that you can slide up and down and look what's behind the window. Like By moving the window, you can see more what's happening at one end or the other. Um, trying to remember, okay, I'm going to age myself. Anybody here old enough to remember when the first one gigabyte drives came out? <laughs> probably him. <laughs> because I'm guessing you're probably old enough to remember when the first gigabyte drives came out. They were like 500 bucks. They were crap. They were garbage. They died. But remember Windows and DOS couldn't read the gigabyte drive? You had to install a special piece of software and it would actually slide a window across the drive. Well, not a physical window, it would actually slide a data port across the drive so you could read past the win, the 512 meg mark, I think it was. So if you wanted to read more than 512 meg, it actually had to install a special driver and it would actually slide the data port based on the address so that it was always addressing an area less than 500 megs. This is the same thing. You have an, a list of variables and it slides the, what you're looking at based on the shift values. And this one shows moving the shift by 3. Again, 1 to 9, then it becomes 4 to 12. Um, there are special parameters. Dollar sign pound tells you how many arguments there are, so you know how many were passed in. It's good to know. Then you'll know if you need to shift or not, right? Um, Dollar sign question mark, we covered already. It tells you what the last command did. Uh, dollar sign, dollar sign expands the current shell's PID. Now, this is something you guys haven't learned about PIDs. And right now, I just echoed my PID 30964. That's the process identifier. Every single program that is running on a Linux machine has a unique number assigned to it. It's known as its program identifier number or its process identifier number. And if I go, so I'm going to type in this command, which is process identif process, and these are all the processes that are running on my VM right now. As you can see, most of them aren't doing anything. Oh, look. Remember earlier I was running BC? Apparently, that's BC stuck in memory and still running. I left it. So, that's the PID is the... So, when you run a bash script, it launches into its own shell and it gets its own process ID. So, if your script just hangs and dies, you can actually go extract it and kill it. Later, the command's called kill. So you can kill the process if you know the PID. And this is doing a few different checks. It checks to see if you pass in any arguments. That's the first if statement. It echoes, you know, zero. You must supply at least one argument. So the command, the name of the command, you must supply one argument. And then it checks to see if dollar sign one is greater than zero. 
then it tells you if it's positive. Otherwise, it gives you a non-positive number. So that is all the if statements. That is all the case statements. What you haven't learned yet is loops. Yay. Um, if you really are excited about loops, you can look at next week's slideshow. Um, however, it looks like a lot take in, but in the end, it's nothing you guys have haven't done in Java. It's nothing you guys haven't done in JavaScript or haven't done in PHP. It's just the first time you've seen such a stupid looking language. So, as my final reminder that I always give out when I'm talking about scripting, watch your spaces. Because you're going to hate yourself. If you spend two hours debugging a program because of a space. Um, the VI is really, really good for editing bash files. As you can see, it does really good syntax highlighting. I would not recommend doing it in Notepad++, although Notepad++, if you save it as a dot uh, B, a dot bash file, it will actually syntax highlight it for you. So if you want to work in Windows and copy paste into your VM, you theoretically can do that. Vim does a much better job, just saying. Eh? I hope so. It was, it was part of lab one, installing it. And then you're supposed to do the, uh, one of the hybrids is doing the Vim tutor, which you can't do without having Vim installed, which tells me you haven't done. It's on, it, what do you mean? It's in your VM. But you can install it in Windows too if you want. It's up to you. You can put it there too if you want. Uh, but that's pretty much it. So, um, and once again, you guys should be finishing off Lab 7 this week. Maybe diving into Lab 8 uh, if you're feeling brave. Um, next week will be, uh, I'm going to be f almost wrapping up Bash scripting. I'll be talking about loops and that kind of stuff. Um, which will give you everything you need for the last set of labs completely. Um, and I swear there's some more Bash scripting in Lecture 10, but I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to go review that again. Yes, lab eight and nine is a demo lab. Essentially, hang on, before I say this. <laughs>